It's the first week of summer here on the farm, and I want to show you what that looks like in the garden and in the kitchen. It's easy to think of summer produce that we all love, but that's just really a small sliver of what's coming out of the garden through the entire growing season. This is our market garden, and this is where we grow produce from about February to November. We can, of course, extend that growing season by using greenhouses and cold frames, but the bulk of our growing is still done here in the summertime when the days are long and the sun is shining. There's so much beautiful food to be grown in these market rows, but the reality is you also have to know that everything has its season and you need to know what to do with it during that season. Most of us grow up with a few vegetables that we really love, but the time when they're in their absolute best is really short and the rest of the year is filled with all kinds of different vegetables in their prime. And figuring that out is part of the joy of being a home cook that also happens to have a garden. So today I'm gathering what's good from the market rows. We'll take it into the little cottage kitchen. We'll talk about it. I'd like to thank Kamikoto for sponsoring today's video. They have offered Elliott Homestead viewers $50 off any purchase using the discount code Elliott Home, and there's a link for that below the video. I adore my Kamikoto knives because their Japanese steel is the absolute best. They're what I've used in my kitchen for years now. Stuart keeps them impossibly sharp for me on the Japanese whetstone. These knives go through a 19 step process that takes several years to complete. Using a team of expert blacksmiths, they shape the Japanese raw steel before polishing and sharpening them to absolute perfection. They'll arrive in a beautiful ashwood box for you, which makes them really easy to store and travel with. 800 years of Japanese technology has gone into crafting these from Japanese steel, and that's why they're so wonderful. Used in Michelin star kitchens all around the world, you can choose from slicing knives to nakiri vegetable knives to utility knives. Just go shopping and go have fun. I'm a long way from a Michelin star chef, but I can certainly delight in having a well-stocked kitchen with tools that really help. Use the code Elliot Home $50 off your purchase, link right below the video. Hello, my friends, and welcome once again to the Elliott Homestead Kitchen. We're excited to be in here today, and we're excited to be talking about summer produce, which probably doesn't look like what you're thinking in your head. So we sort of have this idea about summer produce, and we think, oh, we're going to start this summer garden, and we're going to have armfuls of watermelon and baskets full of tomatoes and eggplant and pepper and basil. And yes, eventually we will, but we're already in the first week of summer and what you're gonna see reflected from the garden right now in my zone 7B garden. So 
So we're nestled like right in the middle of Washington state at the foothills of the Cascade Mountains. And this is very true to form of what we can expect to be pulling from the garden in June. So when I first started homesteading, I had this idea of a summer garden and I thought this will be beautiful and I know what to do with a tomato and I know what to do with a watermelon, but what the heck do I do with all this other stuff that is actually a massive part of the garden? So here's the thing about a garden and vegetable plants in general. Every vegetable has its peak, just like the flowers in the flower garden, but that peak is very short. So if you're wanting to grow a substantial amount of your food, tomatoes are really not gonna get you that far because they're only in their peak for a very short period of time. And yes, we can preserve them. But if we're wanting to eat fresh from the garden and we're wanting to use the space that we have for our vegetable gardens in its maximum capacity, then we're gonna have to learn how to eat a lot of other vegetables and really just sort of go with the flow and go with the seasons. And that's what I wanna to talk to you about today. So I have a basket of goodies that I pulled from the summer garden and I'm gonna just kinda of talk you through them and show you how we eat them. And we're gonna explore a little bit of summer eating. So first things first, a substantial amount of our diet here on the homestead is really good bread products. Whether this is scones or muffins or quick breads or pizza crusts, or just our daily sourdough bread. These are all made from scratch in the kitchen and that is a ton of work. So if this is something that you're wanting to implement as part of your homesteading, as part of your homemaking, just expect it to be a learning curve and expect it to take some time. There's no easy way out. I taught a sourdough class a while ago and a lady emailed me the next day and she said, you know what, my first loaf I made it and it was a disaster and I just don't think sourdough baking is for me. And I responded and I said, you know what, you're probably right. If one loaf is going to be the difference between this being something you wanna pursue and not, then yeah, you should probably just not continue on with sourdough baking because it takes a lot of dedication and it just does, kind of takes a new habit forming, just like you work out or you do any other habit kind of has to become, become part of your routine. So I try to bake our actual bread just once a week. I make two gigantic full sourdough loaves, which is what is behind me here. These have been fermenting since last night and I need to get them in the oven. So we're gonna start there. But it's just worth noting that even though we have all these beautiful vegetables coming from the garden and there's fruit growing on the trees and our freezers are full of meat, Bread is still a big part of our diets here, and it's sort of like our carbohydrate of choice. We bake with really high protein flours like einkorn, and we use natural fermentation like sourdough to break those breads down so that our bodies can process them really well. So I'm gonna pull my Dutch oven out here and get my loaf in. I have a bread uh, recipe that I will share with you in the show notes. So I have two, <laughs> two loaves here. This is always a little bit tricky because I only have one linen couche that I use to proof them both. So I think we'll go ahead and start with this guy. Look at these, these are beautiful. So these are long fermented, I started these yesterday morning. Not the cleanest transfer, but that's okay. So these are really big loaves, about 950 grams of flour each. So we can eat on one of these loaves for probably three or four days. Where did I put my mitt? All right, this one will have to wait until that one is done. So I hear a lot of people, especially right now, that are really eager to get their hands dirty and start growing their own food and start cooking from scratch, which I think is awesome. Yes, absolutely, amen, go and do it. Um, 
How people do that fully without bread, I don't know because I don't want to be in that world. <laughs> but I know also that a substantial amount of our calories that we're eating this time of year come from meat. So we grow out probably around six lambs per year here on the farm. And then we also will grow out whatever calf Cece has given us. So Cece's our dairy cow. We keep her for milk and butter and cheese and cream and yogurt and all our beautiful dairy needs, which we'll talk about in a second. But in terms of meat, right now we are growing out our own lambs and growing out our own beef, but we're not growing out our own chickens anymore. And that's because we found a great local farm that's getting their chicks from the same place we did and feeding their chickens the same grain that we were feeding ours and doing it in a much more efficient way and we don't have to do it. So I am really happy to support them in their small business and say, here's my money, just give me the chickens. So I'm actually picking up 25 chickens from them next week and we do that order probably about twice a year. I kind of like to calculate one chicken per week, which isn't a ton. But chicken is also expensive and it's kind of a little bit more of a luxury item than most people think about it. You know, you got to pluck all the feathers. It's a lot of work. Um, so chickens are being sourced from another farm right now. And again, I'm very happy to do that. I love chickens. I don't love plucking chickens. I don't love butchering chickens. So I'm really happy to outsource this to another farm. So those are meat needs taken care of. We keep four gigantic freezers up in our shop where we store this meat pretty much year round. Now we can do this because electricity is really cheap here where we live. And so that means that we don't, we're not really having to worry about the cost of running those freezers. But meat is calories. And I gotta say, in terms of homesteading, I can't imagine a homestead without meat because input to output in terms of it's going to take me this much money, this much time, this many calories to grow my food. There is no food that gives that back like meat. It is a staple. It's a necessity. Our bodies here, at least in our family, completely thrive on it. So we eat a very meat central diet, which is great. Tons of amino acids, great for protein intake, all that. So bread, good sourdough breads is a huge staple. Meats is a staple, a variety. We also get really great fish delivered right from the Washington coast, just a couple hours away. So we, we eat salmon and halibut often. We also eat chicken and we butcher our own ducks. So lots of meat needs and lots of meat needs being met right here on our farm or from our local community. Before we dive into our vegetable basket, I also want to talk about dairy needs because again, input to output in terms of calories that you can produce on a small piece of land, there is no food besides meat that rivals dairy products. So we keep a Jersey dairy cow. Her name's Cece, and we've had her for six years now. She's wonderful, but she's also open. The bull that we bred her to last year after giving her a little bit of a hiatus from milking, turns out didn't perform his duties very well on Cece or on the herd that he's with year round. So Cece's open, which means that she's not pregnant. She's not going to give us a calf. She's also not in milk. Cows work just like humans where you need to have a baby, get your hormones going, and then you produce milk. So Cece is now at my friend Molly's ranch being bred to a beef bowl, and she's super happy to be there. She's in a big herd of cows in the great wide open, having the time of her life. However, that leaves us without milk for at least another nine months, and that is a problem. So in trying to kind of problem solve this, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna buy milk? Are we gonna buy maybe a dairy sheep, something that we could get rid of a lot easier when Cece does have her calf? Um, I was kind of troubleshooting this with Molly. Again, going back to that local community. And just so happens, she has an extra dairy cow this year. A cow that didn't mean to get bred, got bred, gave birth to a beautiful little heifer calf, and is now in milk. And she said, hey, would you be willing to maybe trade some of your garden produce for use of this cow for as long as you want? You can have her for a month. You can have her for six months while you wait for Cece to calve, which is just amazing that I have a friend who just happens to have an extra dairy cow. So she will be coming to our farm and we're going to be milking her, which is probably going to be a little bit of a circus. 
Dairy cows tend to like their own people and not like other people. So we'll see how that goes. But the exciting news is that milk, fresh milk, raw milk will be back on the Elliott Homestead. And I'm very excited for that because I've set a goal of storing up as much butter as humanly possible. And a dairy cow certainly makes that possible. So the milk front is looking good. Hopefully, maybe in a week or two weeks time, she'll be here and we'll be milking her. So I'm really looking forward to that. But let's also talk about the veg part of summer eating. So we've got our meat still accounted for. We're gonna be eating on last year's harvest until late this fall when we harvest again. Milk is accounted for, bread's accounted for, and that really leaves us with vegetables. I wanted to kind of just talk you through um, troubleshooting, I guess you could say, a little bit in the garden. So, <clears throat> I don't even know what's in here. I literally pulled this basket out of my cold room because we harvested a few things yesterday and I figured this would show you how we actually use it. There's nothing uh, staged here. Okay, beets are beautiful. Beets are a big storage crop for us. Beets are also the kind of thing that you can store them, but anytime you pull a vegetable, the sugars will start to decrease in it. So it's it's very sweetest when you first pull it. That's why garden produce tastes so good. These are good natural sugars. So these are a touchstone gold beet. These are a fresh eating beet. Last year I grew a ton of beets for storage and I just, we love beets and we eat a lot of them, but you can only eat so many beets. And so this year I grew a lot of fresh eating beets, ones that weren't meant for storage long-term. And that means that we just get to eat them now but they're so good. And it's one of the, like, just eat while the eaten's good, you know? These can be ready now, and we can basically be harvesting and pulling beets through October, maybe even November. So this is a really long-term crop. They're best when they're about this size, the size of kind of like a big golf ball. This is when they're at their sweetest. So breakfast, for example, might look like going to pull a couple of beets, um, I don't even peel them when they're like this because the skin's so tender, sauteing little pieces of beet up in butter and serving it on toast with an egg. That would be a perfect breakfast for me. Of course, beets can be pickled as well. Um, the carrots are just really starting to come in. Last year's carrot harvest was really poor because it was our first year of a no-dig garden. I'll tag the no-dig videos down below but it took time for the cardboard to dissolve. But the carrots are looking really good. These are small, um, but they're really good to eat fresh. And we haven't had fresh carrots for a while, which is why I pulled them so that we can enjoy them. These are a Bolero storage carrot. So this is a main crop for us. We store carrots year round. Although this year I'm also going to try freeze drying a mirepoix. So celery, onion, and carrot. Freeze drying little pieces of that and then having a jar of it, which would save me a ton of chopping time in the winter time. Green onions this time of year are really good and really kind of, I think of them as like a major food crop. We basically eat them on everything and with everything. I think I grew four different varieties. So the white part's my favorite, but what that leaves me with is a bunch of green tops, which is what these are. So I'm going to be chopping these up fine and freeze drying them. I'll link the freeze dryer that I use below if you'd like to check that out. And then that way I'm hoping I can just have, um, you know, if you make a really beautiful potato soup in the wintertime with bacon and cheese and all that kind of stuff, it'd be the perfect thing to sprinkle green onions over when you don't have fresh, ch fresh chives. So learn to love green onions. <laughs> I have a lot of them this year. Onions are a massive part of what we grow. Um, and they're delicious. So you got to eat them while they're good because they'll get big and fat and tough. So it's kind of a short window. I would say probably about six weeks where the green onions are really at their best. And you can get that again in the fall if you succession plant. It's getting hot here this week, finally. And that means that I'm basically pulling the last, the last of our lettuces. So this is a romaine variety that I grow. Massive and beautiful. A lot of times when you first start gardening, not only do you not know what you're doing, I've been there, but you also don't know how to store things. So if you're pulling greens from your garden right now, which you inevitably will all of the spring garden and into the summer garden, 
What you want to do is get them into a tub or a bowl, um, anything that will hold a bunch of cold water and swish them around and let them hang out in the cold water for at least 45 seconds, a minute. Not only does this help remove some of the dirt and some of the bugs, um, but it helps it to stay crisp. So typically, I'll do that with my lettuce, then I'll lay out a tea towel, put the lettuce on the tea towel, and just roll it up and store it in my refrigerator just like that. Then whenever I wanna make a salad or anything of the sort, I'll just take the whole roll out, unroll it, and there's beautiful clean lettuce leaves on there for me to use. So this one's gonna be turned into a Caesar salad for dinner because it's my very last romaine. But again, lettuce isn't something that you would typically think you'd see in the summer garden. So it's really beautiful green. We grow lots of greens. We grow collard greens and kale, spinach, arugula, and a variety of different lettuces. Collard greens love the heat. Kale will tolerate it through the summer, although it tends to get a little bit bitter. But green season is coming to an end now. And instead of these tender greens, we're gonna be eating cabbage. Cabbage is beautiful in the summer, and I grow a bunch of different varieties. I grow a Napa cabbage for kimchi. I grow this uh, crinkled little cabbage because I think it's really beautiful. It's called a Savoy cabbage. I grew these honestly because I wanted to photograph them but they also make really good pickled cabbage leaves for things like cabbage rolls. So I'm gonna try that this year. I'm gonna peel off my big leaves and make up a vegetable mixture and actually make cabbage rolls, pickle them, and stick them in the refrigerator. I'll share that when I get there. That's not today's task. Today's task is dealing with a crop that most people don't see and that you probably won't really see unless you have a really good farmer's market or you have your own garden and that are these little beauties. That is, that are, <laughs> oh, you guys. Okay, check this out. So these are garlic scapes. You've probably seen them before, but they only come from hardneck garlic varieties. So we have big beds of garlic, which is a staple crop for us, out in the market garden right now. And what happens is we plant the garlic in the fall and in the spring, it sends up these shoots. Now, if you leave these on the plant, this will turn into a flower. And what will happen is that the garlic will put all of its energy into making that flower instead of making the bulb. So not only is this sort of delicious to harvest, but it's also a necessity because if I weren't to pull these off, I wouldn't get big heads of garlic, which is what I want. Typically in the vegetable garden, you'll learn that you either get a head or a root, but you don't get both. So if you let a flower develop, you don't get a root. If you let a root develop to its fullest, you're not gonna get a flower, at least if you're managing it correctly. So garlic scapes are really tender, very mild garlic flavor. And I wanna pickle these today because that's one of my favorite ways to preserve them. I don't use vinegar to pickle a ton. I like to use salt and fermentation, but these are kind of an exception because the kinds of things I put garlic scapes in, let's say a pasta salad or a roast dish, that bright acidic vinegar flavor is very welcomed along with the garlic. So we're gonna actually bust out our kamikoto knife and we're gonna pickle these beautiful garlic scapes. Okay, we just have a few things left in our basket that I wanna show you. Again, not things that you would think of that would be reflective of a summer basket, but we're having a bumper crop of peas, which is absolutely beautiful. I always grow the kind where you can just eat the pod because my kids love peas so much, they'll just go out to the garden like little gremlins and just hunt amongst the branches until they find them, that I was never getting peas developed in inside anyway. So instead I just grow the variety that's meant for this and don't really preserve them. I know there's lots of ways that you can, but again, this is one of those things you just eat while the eating is good. Probably a four week window of really good pea pods if your weather, um, you know, what's the word? You know, your weather is, you no, know, like it does what you want it to do. Cooperates. Cooperates. <laughs> okay, and broccoli. So again, these tend to get categorized as spring crops, but here's the thing. These are growing in the spring. They're not ready to harvest. Again, I'm in a 7B garden. There is very little coming from the garden. Arugula, 
radishes, spinach. Those are the first things to come. But even then, they don't come until late April, May. So there is a massive period of time where you're just not getting a lot from your garden. So even though we categorize these as spring vegetables, really, they're good for eating right now here in the first week of summer. So this is a method that I use a lot with preserving, which is what I call a quick pickle. And you just use a jar that will seal well, that has a fresh seal. And I have half water and half apple cider vinegar heating up on the stove top. I'm gonna bring that to a boil. And then all I'm going to do, of course you could season this with bay leaves, salt, peppercorns, dill, anything you like. I'm just gonna dump that boiling liquid right over the top of these garlic scapes, close the jar, let it cool to room temperature, and then transfer it to the refrigerator. And this will keep for a very long time in the refrigerator. Makes it really easy, because I can go out and scoop out a little bit of the garlic scapes, mince them up, and add them to whatever recipe I'd like all throughout the winter. But you could use this method for anything. I've used it for jalapenos, and chili peppers and of course cucumbers, really any vegetable, even a mix of vegetables if you only have a little bit coming from each crop at the same time. So part of spring eating and part of just eating from the garden or eating from the homestead in general, it kind of means you need to be flexible. What doesn't often happen here is that I'll come up with a recipe that I wanna make and I'll go to the store and get all the ingredients. I rarely do that unless I'm really having a craving for something in particular. But how this typically works is the night before, I'll set our menu for the next day, knowing what I know are the chickens laying, is the cow in milk, what meat is defrosted, what's growing in the garden. The tricky part is that, you know, things like our fruit trees, sometimes you might have five ripe apricots and sometimes you might have 500. Depends on the day, it depends on the year. This year we're not gonna have any apricots. We lost all of them to a very, very late, very hard frost. So you never kind of know what's coming. <laughs> you never know what's coming. Each day is its own adventure in the kitchen. So I try to stay really flexible and then make dishes that allow for that flexibility. So salads is a great example because you can make salads out of pretty much anything, any amount that you have growing in the garden. Um, we eat a lot of pasta because I love to make pasta. Again, another really versatile sort of basic idea that you can add snap peas to and a little bit of broccoli and some shredded carrot and you can call it a day. Um, soup, of course, is another really popular one although not quite as popular in the summertime. But the idea is still the same, that you can just take a basic idea and then use whatever the garden is offering or whatever your little farm or even your farmer's market is offering. And that's part of where sort of this intuition comes in. And this is the hardest part to grow in yourself and mature in yourself, but also to teach other people. You know, we teach our cooking community for a living. And we give recipes and we give ideas, but the idea is that you're actually cultivating a home cook who can sort of think on their feet, adapt a recipe because they understand the basic principles. This little quick pickle is a perfect example. If you understand the concept of a quick pickle, which is 50% water, 50% vinegar brine, basically over anything in a good, clean, sterilized jar, 
now your entire world opens and you can utilize that however it fits on your farm. Do not inhale that. It is so vinegary. Look at that. See how simple that is? These are the kinds of things though, unless somebody shows you or you learn it from somewhere, you just don't know. It's one of the things I love about homesteading and gardening in general is that you never stop being a student. There's always stuff to learn. We do teach people how to sort of feel more confident, more inspired, generally more at peace in their kitchen. So if you'd like to join our cooking community, I'm gonna put a link below the video to do just that. It's a great place to kind of get your feet wet in the whole food kitchen arena. But we're also doing these new workshops and I'll talk more about this later, but I'm gonna put a link for those down below the video as well. These are private, much more intimate settings where we're gonna be cooking through recipes together, learning new skills and having a very good time. We will meet via Zoom and they're four hour workshops. So tons of information packed into um, a really neat intimate learning environment and into a you know fairly quick time period. So I'll put a link below the video for that as well if you would really like to dive into the deep end of preserving and eating from the farm. Also, don't forget to use your Kamikoto coupon, Elliot Home. There's a link below the video for $50 off your Kamikoto knife. You're gonna love these. These are the knives that I use in my kitchen and they're absolutely wonderful. So thanks for joining us today and I hope that this has inspired you to eat well from your own summer garden. Enjoy.